Very good morning, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Himadri and AIUS for giving us this opportunity. It's, I feel privileged to be here today to speak about this wonderful technique of, uh, conventional technique of scleral buckling. Excuse me. Yeah. So I would like to start with the brief history. Well, in the early part of 20th century, it was Ignipuncture by Jules Gonin and the scleral shortling techniques which were popular for retinal detachment surgery and they had limited success. But it was uh, uh, close to 1945 when Ernest Custodius came up with his series of brilliant uh, uh, results from sterile buckling using uh, polyviol explants, diathermy, and non-drainage technique. It was close to 1965 that Harvey Linkoff came up with uh, his modifications with use of silicon sponge, cryotherapy, spatulated needle, and his own rules to find the retinal breaks, which resulted in the current form of conventional sterile buckling. A quick review of surgical anatomy. Any attempt to do scleral buckling should have a thorough and sound knowledge of the anatomy of conjunctiva tenens intermuscular septum, the insertion of extraocular muscles, the relation between superior rectus and superior oblique muscle insertion, the extent of vitreous base and thickness of sclera at various parts, especially the thinnest part which is posterior to the insertion of rectus muscles. I would like to give special importance to vortex veins because during the hooking of muscles, we have to be careful that we stay pre-equatorial to avoid hooking up the vortex veins, which exit close to 14 to 18 mm posterior to limbus. Also, during SRF drainage, we have to be very careful that it is better done close to the horizontal recti to avoid injury to the exit of, verti uh, yeah, of the various vortex veins. And while suturing, we need to be careful that there is an intrascleral part of vortex vein which before its exit from the sclera, and we have to avoid injuring that part while suturing. As far as the effect of buckling is concerned, in short, it actually shifts the equilibrium towards attached retina by promoting the addition of retina and by reducing traction. Coming to the instrumentation and the buckle elements, well, cryotherapy is the commonly used modality for vitreoretinal adhesion formation now, and it works on the principle of Jules Thomson effect, whereby drop in temperature is noted due to rapid expansion of a compressed gas. Medium grade burns is, ex is something which is desirable, whereby the retina turns just white after cryopexy and turns back to faint gray area or representing retinal edema. The maximum strength of cryopexy comes by around 12th day. The silicone exoplants, if we look at its properties, it has all desirable biological properties, and broadly it is divided into bands and strips, implants and wedges, tires and sponges. The 240 band, as you all know, is commonly used, with, uh, which is, has a width of 2.5 millimeters. For tires, I would like to give a brief description. They can be either concave tires or convex tires. The concave ones are asymmetrical or symmetrical. The asymmetrical ones give better high and higher posterior indent and are better suited for horseshoe tear while the symmetrical ones are better suited for lattice degenerations or atrophic holes. The convex tires, on the other hand, are best suited for dialysis. The radial sponge, although are not commonly used now, but they are better suited for radial placement and for posterior breaks. The suture material is 5-0 polybutylate coated braided polyester, and the needle is spatulated needle, which has flat, flat top and flat bottom, which assists in proper suturing. Coming to the surgical steps, well, a thorough pre-operative workup has to, can, the, the, is really important for scleral buckling. Proper documentation of all the findings are desired, and that helps us to make sure that none of the findings are missed and all breaks are properly sealed. Coming to the next step of conjunctival peritomy, slinging of uh, muscles and brittle sutures, the key points are that conjunctiva and tenon should both be properly separated. A limbal frill of two millimeters can be left for uh, saving the limbal stem cells. Uh, radial cuts at three o'clock and nine o'clock do help in uh, uh, maneuvering the eye, and Stevens stenotomy scissors, scissors should be used between the four recti for proper dissection. Sweeping circumferential motion helps in slinging the recti, and it, it, we should make sure that there is no resistance felt because that sh that uh, that if any resistance actually suggests that probably we have gone through the muscle. Also, heart rate needs to be monitored carefully because oculocardiac reflex can cause bradycardia. This is a surgeon's view of all the four rectus muscles while hooking the muscles, and we have to be especially careful while hooking the superior rectus muscle because uh, the insertion of superior oblique muscle lies below it, 
and we don't need to go too posterior. Break localization marking and cryopexy. Well, these are critical steps. We have to make sure that all the breaks are located and marked. And uh, we can use specially designed locate localizers for the same. For bullous RID, we can use the DACE technique, that is drainage followed by air, cryopexy, and the encerclage. This helps in uh, overcoming the parallax error which we have in uh, bullous RID. But we have to be careful that air causes thermal insulation and cryotherapy effect can get enhanced because of air. Small breaks, a single spot is enough for marking, while larger breaks will need three spots. The cryopexy marks should break, uh, ma the cryopexy should be of medium grade. The entire break should be covered with contiguous burns. We should avoid shaft indentation. This happens with the beginners. And complete thawing should be ensured before withdrawal. The next step, an important step, is deciding which tire to use. Well, anterior posterior ex extent of the tire should be such that the center or anterior crest of the buckle should be the area where the posterior edge of the brake lies, and the expand should at least extend 1 to 2 mm beyond the posterior margin of the brake. Another important fact is lateral extent, and it should be at least 1 clock hour on either side of the tear. The explants are then placed in the concerned quadrant. Temporary mattress sutures are preferably placed. Sterile pockets are made to pass the encircling band. And end to end, we have either Watsky sleeve or we have Clovish knot. Both of them have their own advantages and disadvantages. The suture placement, some key points, the anterior bite should be one millimeter below, behind the muscle insertions to avoid any anterior segment ischemia. The posterior bite should preferably be close to 1.5 millimeter on each side of the, uh, to get a higher buckle indent. Then we have uh, the segmental buckle. Well, the suture related indent can be sufficient enough to settle down a localized RD with shallow SRF, no PVR, and the retinal dialysis or breaks limited to one to two clock clock hours. And for that, segmental buckle can be done. Coming to subretinal fluid drainage, well, it is indicated for bullous RD, old patients, high myopes, or in glaucomatous patients. And the site should be carefully selected, which has sufficient SRF, and preferably above or below the horizontal merid meridian to avoid the vortex veins, and slightly anterior to the equator, on the, under the bed of the buckle. The cut down technique was initially being followed, but now trans transcleral needle drainage is preferably done, whereby a 26 gauge entry is sufficient enough to cause uh, drainage of the uh, subretinal fluids, and it is done till the pigment particles are seen. The f this is followed by permanent knots, and the knots should be rotated posteriorly. We need to inspect to look for any fish mouthing. It has to be made sure that there is adequate height of buckle and all breaks are well supported, and we need to see if there is any dispulsation or any evidence of high IOP, for which we may need to do paracentesis. As far as closure is concerned, we, the brittle sutures are cut, antibiotic wash is given, and conjunctiva and tenons should preferably be closed separately. As far as the complications are concerned, well, no surgery is without any complications, but even though the list looks big, the incidence is not as huge. We can have oculocardial re cardi cardiac reflex or injury to the vortex veins perforation during the surgery. Early post-operative complications include some important ones like anterior segment ischemia or anger closure glaucoma, for which we have to be carefully seeing the patient in the post-operative period. Late onset post-operative complications like refractive errors or extrusion and infection can also happen. Coming to the conclusion, well, we have to remember that this is an elegant extraocular surgery which is landmark and which has uh, really increased the results uh, multifold as far as the success of retinal detachment surgery is concerned. It is definitely less expensive and has got excellent results. This is one of the cases which I operated and we can see that in 15 days, the, even the macular cysts, which due to chronic chronicity of RD, settled down so beautifully. I must say that uh, Dr. Himadri has come up with this brilliant idea to uh, rediscover scleral buckling, and all of us should try and learn uh, from him and from the other speakers about how to revive scleral buckling and the ways we can revive it in the current generation. Thank you, Dr. Himadri, and thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot, Dr. Jayan, for this wonderful.